We welcome you to the National Sports Center in Blaine, Minnesota, as USA Ultimate proudly presents the 2019 U.S. Open Ultimate Championships. The men's championship game features the defending national champions, New York Pony, and the perennial powerhouse, Seattle Sockeye. Good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to have you with us with Ian Toner, former national champion, and Megan Tormey down in the field. I am Evan Lepler. Ian, the U.S. Open has gradually become one of the marquee events on the Ultimate Calendar, evolving into a tournament that truly sets the tone for the season, and both these teams, Pony and Sockeye, looking to make an early statement today. A budding rivalry between these two programs. No love lost between them dating back to their national championship semifinal matchup in 2018 in San Diego. This is an opportunity to gain an early edge as these teams inch deeper into the regular season and closer to the playoffs. And this is the first meeting between what many called the game of the year last year in San Diego. Pony beat Sockeye by one in the semis and then trounced the defending 2017 champions revolver. Let's talk about this Pony team. They are not the number one seed at this tournament because Sockeye got the season off with a win at Colorado Cup, but Ponies look very good this weekend behind their strong coaching, their talented depth, and what Grant Lindsley has added to this team, the former Revolver star, now on Pony, he's making a huge difference. What an incredible addition to this offense. He's got great chemistry with Pony's throwers already, understanding which spots on the field he needs to attack, and he's also deadly with the disc in his hand. An accomplished player, someone who's gonna stretch the field in more ways than one. Formerly with Minnesota, then with San Francisco, a champion, a world champion. He'll be going against some of his former teammates today on this uh, Seattle team that, let's be honest, they might be the favorites heading into the new year, adding some young talent. They got Dylan Freechild back though, and he might be the key to getting Sakai his first championship in more than a decade. The World Games veteran is about as explosive as you can get in this division. You know he's going to be attacking with speed and pace in the handler space. He's not afraid to take big defensive matchups. You know he's hungry to face off against one of his best buds, Jimmy Mickle. I'm expecting to see him on both sides of the disc today. Seattle has consistently been one of the top teams in the country over the past decade, but the, the biggest prize has eluded them. Mike Caldwell now in a coaching role. The veteran tries to lead Sockeye to a U.S. Open title today. Opening pull from Minnesota coming up. The USA Ultimate U.S. Open Club Championships are presented by Spin Ultimate, providing custom team uniforms and ultimate apparel since 2007. Visit Spin Ultimate on the web at spinultimate.com. By the Ultimate History Book, illuminating the legendary stories, moments, and photos from the sport of Ultimate over the past 50 years. Learn more at ultimatehistorybook.com. And by Discraft, home of the Ultra Star, the official disc of USA Ultimate. Now featuring an updated website to make ordering custom discs easier than ever. Visit discraft.com for all your custom disc needs. Championship Sunday at USA Ultimate's US Open. Steamy conditions, it is warm down on the field. Our intrepid Megan Tormey bearing the brunt of the heat with our pregame report, Megan. Thank you so much, Evan. Both teams have stepped onto the field today knowing that defense is going to be the difference maker. Coach Brian Jones of Pony understands that Sockeye likes to run a fluid offense, so they're going to have to remain agile, but the point being that their players were going to have to help when they're on the weak side, defend the strong side. Coach David Hogan of Sakai is equally respectful of Pony's practically perfect offense and says this game is going to be a test of their ultimate IQ. They're playing straight matchups, but it's going to take help from one another at the appropriate times, and finding those appropriate times is what he feels is going to give them an edge over Pony. Megan, great stuff. There's no love lost between these two teams. They certainly respect each other, but that semifinal in San Diego was as contentious a game as there was all season. And you know, both teams would love to make a powerful statement here today. Sockeye in the white, they'll pull to get things started. Pony won the flip and chose to start on offense.
Both these teams have recreated themselves over the past few years. More than half the rosters are new in the past few years. They are very talented. And here we go, Seattle pulling to New York. Pony in the black, and the pole lands inbounds and bounces out of bounds. So Sean Keegan, one of the top handlers for New York, will trot over to scoop it up. When the pole bounces out the back, he brings it to the front of the end zone. If the pole had landed out of bounds, he would have gotten it 20 yards further forward. Billy Katz picks him up on the mark, and here we go. Vertical stack and Alex Thorne, one of the newcomers for Pony. University of Pittsburgh star, college champ in 2012 and 2013. And Thorne and Keegan playing catch right now. And then launching deep, looking for Chris Kotcher. He had a couple steps and then he got hammered as a couple sockeye players tumble. Wide open deep is William Dean. Christian Foster and Matt Russell colliding for Sockeye defensively and a turnover free hold despite some collisions on that opening point. Well, you can see Pony was just waiting for that deep shot to materialize. As you mentioned, Keegan and Thorne comfortable playing catch, resetting at the front of the stack, breaking the mark, not necessarily gaining tons of yardage. But it's great to see Thorne back in the U.S. men's club game and having an impact after spending so much time competing in the United Kingdom and abroad for the last several years. Played with a great Britain powerhouse team, Clapham. And William Dean, a great filler player for this Pony squad, the UMass alum. Paul's in the first goal of the game. We're playing a 15. The clock indicates the time we are away from the soft cap. I've got a hunch, though, that these teams are going to score goals quickly today. If, if the game was 10-10 when the soft cap went on, we'd be playing at 12. But that clock may be a little superfluous early in the game because these offenses are going to be hard to stop. And I think that was what Megan was talking about when it came to the keys. One or two blocks, one or two mistakes could decide this thing turnover margin will be one of the key stats to look at when this game finishes. Simon Montague to Jacob Jannon. Now here's Dylan Freechild, sporting a new number this year. He's gotten a 27 jersey on. Trent Dillon resets for Montague. This is Phil Murray. Chris Kasednar back to Murray. By adding so much explosive talent, the Sockeye offense has certainly evolved a bit. They can play virtually any style. Kasednar with a cheeky lefty backhand over the mark to Simon Montague who snuck. A little bit downfield, and that was enough to equalize us one all. You see that end zone set that's so popular in the game of Ultimate right now. Get a couple crafty throwers with a lot of space near the front of the end zone, and just line up a soft inside break throw. Sometimes it's a scuba, sometimes it's an offhand backhand. It's so difficult for the mark to defend and for the downfield defender guarding that receiver to defend and Montague attacking there from the reset space. New York coach Brian Jones told us after the game yesterday when they beat truck stop from Washington DC in the semifinals, he said, we only want to give them three easy scores for the game. If if they're getting scores easily, that's a problem. Sometimes they'll score on a difficult shot. They'll make a great play. We respect that. They're the great players. W would you call what Sockeye just did an easy score, or did Pony put up enough defensive resistance, do you think? I mean, I want to know what the play call was, the defensive assignment was going into that point. From afar, it looked like the Pony defense did a good job of not letting Sockeye score quickly and with their preferred four side option. They had to swing the disc. They had to be patient in the red zone. 
So with that in mind, I do think they did succeed there. Keegan hustles to haul that one in, launches the hammer for Jimmy Mickle, who reads it well and runs it down. No turns through the first three points. Pony leads two to one. Jimmy Mickle, the golden boy, with his first score of the final. Sean Keegan and Jimmy Mickle both have won a pair of national titles. They were teammates with Denver Johnny Bravo in 2014 and last year with New York Pony. They've got a great connection, Ian. Sean Keegan unafraid to reach into his throwing arsenal and break the mark with this towering hammer. Mickle seeing the soft spot and inching over to that break space for an easy finish. Ponies Marquez Brownlee launching the pull. He's heading our centers to Montague as Matt Rader picked up by Kevin Norton. Denies him the disc initially. Here's Jacob Jannon. And a pick away from the disc. It'll stay with Dylan Freechild. Unlike basketball, you cannot set picks downfield. Ultimate, by the letter of the law, is a non-contact game. Although watch yesterday's semifinal between Pony and Truck Stop and try to reiterate that rule and it's a little confusing. There's as much contact as the players allow there to be in a self-officiated sport. Very entertaining men's semifinal yesterday. On serve at the half and Truck Stop just ran out of gas. Pony a strong second half to close it out. Free child swings it. This is Russell, downfield for Jannon. Still have not seen a turnover yet in the game, and Clark Kofer in the black pony jersey taken off his feet. So what do we got? I think that it was close enough. Okay, my ruling, you didn't have it, you weren't close enough to play, so it's staying here. Good to see Kofor okay after that collision. If we remember last year at the US Open, he was involved in a play that resulted in a gash on his head and required him to leave the field to play. Brownlee putting pressure on Montague. It's a fun matchup. Montague, one of the best throwers in the world, and Marquez Brownlee has really improved over the past couple of years. But Pony's defense unable to prevent another sockeye score as Jacob Jannon hauls it in. His third year on the team, he's got sockeye's second goal of the day. This point brought to you by Simon Montague, the great facilitator for this sockeye offense. Getting things started, initiating, attacking in the handler space, moving the disc for the width of the field and finding those skinny inside out lane windows to gain yards while resetting the disc. An important point of emphasis and a unique skill for a thrower like Montague. And Montague, for the better part of this decade, has been considered one of the more dynamic, crafty throwers because he doesn't have a normal style. He's long, he's lanky, I'm not sure how you mark him to try and slow him down, do you? Neither am I. I think when you are a defensive play caller trying to set that strategy, you really have to take, it, you can't look at the Simon Montague mark in a vacuum. You have to understand, okay, what's the wind doing? How can I help that be a defender, if at all? Okay. Where do I see the downfield receivers having strengths or weaknesses? Where do I want to be pushing the disc? I don't have the perfect answer at this moment, but there are some throwers who are one-dimensional and who you can throw a certain mark on any time and, and know you're going to generate pressure. Simon Montague is not one of those guys. Again, the pull lands inbounds and rolls out the back. Harper Garvey will pick it up and take it to the front line. Grant Lindsley on the stage first. Beats Trent Dillon just barely. And here's Kotcher downfield. 
Picked up by Shane Worthington. And here's Thorne, open by about 20 yards on Sockeye's Christian Foster. Fun to see both defensive strategists changing the matchups. Lindsley looking for Keegan. And Sean Keegan has started this game with an assist and a score in Pony's first three points. No surprise here. The disciplined, well-structured Pony stack swinging the disc until that perfect deep shot opens up. And there's so much discipline by the other cutters on the field that the throwing lane and the cutting lane for Keegan and Lindsley from the thrower's perspective is just unobstructed. No hesitation from Lindsley. Certainly a great thrower, but more of a downfield initiating cutter and deep threat. You would think Sockeye would prefer Lindsley throwing deep to Keegan compared to the other way around. I'd agree with that, and I think this just shows you how versatile and how deadly each and every player on this starting Pony offensive unit is and how much of a challenge David Hogan and Mike Caldwell have on their hands in this game. Brian Jones, the defensive coordinator for Ponies, having a tough time slowing Sockeye down. This is the first leg of the Triple Crown Tour USA Ultimates competitive structure that has been in place since 2012 when the US Open was first held. This is the third year in a row that the Open has been staged in Blaine, Minnesota, here at the National Sports Center, a magnificent complex. And not only the international club competition, but also the youth club competition, the ICC and the YCC tournaments going on side by side. Great chance for some of the veteran players who are now coaching youth players to multitask. And of course, some of the youth players get to watch the greatest players in the sport. This is Xander Quizon Tice over to Dylan Freechild. Both those guys out of the University of Oregon. And here's Matt Rader. The longest tenured member of the Sockeye squad. Rader in his 12th year, although I asked him, how does it feel to be the most tenured person on the team? I was, I was. I was, I was close and when he just started. Go ahead and go ahead and go ahead and get your space. Observe a ruling. There was a pick. Stay there. We're good. Hank Carey not wanting to waste any more time. Matt Rader, when asked about being the longest tenured guy on the team, he said MC is still around, so I don't feel that old. Mike Caldwell, longtime player, now moving into a coaching role. So that's a good point by Rader, who's in his 12th year on Sockeye. And he's just 27 years old. He made the team when he was 16. And he's still scoring goals more than a decade later. Free child to Raider. No turns through the first six points of the men's final. Just an incredibly small window once Dylan Freechild got this disc. And he was able to continue down that break space into the end zone. It looked like Haskell, his mark, was perhaps trying to set a flat mark or trying to change the force at the last second because the earlier marks were forcing backhand and then you let that flick throw off when the rest of the downfield defenders are expecting that part of the field to be taken away by the mark. It's just, it's tough for a defense and great job by Freechild making him pay. Interesting, that's New York coach Brian Jones chatting with Sockeye star Dylan Freechild. Any sense of what they're conversing? One of the interesting dynamics of Ultimate Frisbee that the players are intermingled on the sideline having conversations about the flow of the game, the rules, how the physicality is working out for both teams throughout. It's really a, a fascinating development. And I think right there that conversation was 
harkening back to the pick call uh, that was made on, on Phil Murray's defender on Phil Murray. Chris Kotcher. Near the line, but Lindsley ruled inbounds. The observers do make active calls in and out on the sidelines and in the end zone. Ben Snell trying to stick to Mickle like Lou in the backfield, but Mickle just stays out of the way and allows Kotcher to find Keegan, who continues his strong first half. 32-year-old Sean Keegan, University of Delaware product, puts Pony up 4-3. First half. Back at the U.S. Open Club Championships here in Blaine, Minnesota, the men's championship game is a stalemate thus far. No turnovers through the first seven points. Pony has a 4-3 lead. Here's the last offensive sequence for New York. High-quality ultimate by both offenses. And I've been paying close attention to how these teams have been rearranging their matchups. I've seen Julian Hausman draw Jimmy Mickle. I've seen Ben Snell draw Jimmy Mickle. I've seen Tyler Haskell draw Dylan Freechild. We've seen some other moving around. I think Sockeye needs to devote one of its top matchups to Sean Keegan. Because as much as he might be in pain or he might be making fun of himself, He's having a big impact early on, and they've got to find a way to contain him. The intensity of a championship game on national TV is not enough to stop this Pony team from mocking each other during the game. Fair? And that's the culture that this team has. They, they can be intense, but they can also be lighthearted. And... And that's a, that's a team building thing, right? Being able to have those inside jokes, make fun of each other, reminds yourself that, hey, we're in a big competitive moment, but we're also in this together. We've got each other's backs. Jack Hatchett had his traditional tropical cap on yesterday. But for the broadcast, he puts on the pony blue cap. Long time Boston. Ultimate star launches the pull and a good one. Montague, a few yards outside of his own end zone, catches the first pass. And a different defensive look here from New York. What do you see? Yeah, this is the first time we've seen a zone type look from the Pony defense. Looks very interested in keeping that disc in the middle of the field, funneling it in the middle of the field, and minimizing any mid-yardage gainers. Layout grab by Jannon to maintain possession. And now it looks like this, these defenders have shuffled into their man-to-man -man matchups. Dylan looking deep, and Raider was unable to make the catch. Off his fingertips, intercepted by Brownlee. The game's first turnover off Raider's hands. A pick downfield with Pony in possession about 71 yards away from the first break of the game. It's a catch Raiders made before in his life, but he did have pressure in the area. And another stoppage downfield. Marquez Brownlee, better known to the technologi technology world is MKBHD, YouTube superstar, multi-millions of followers, and a championship game turnover here at the US Open. So Pony 0 for 1 on break chances. And Dylan Freechild ends that point, the longest of the game thus far. For all. Missed opportunity for Pony and great recovery by Sakai after the turnover. Just causing enough chaos at the front of that stack to 
and sight confusion on that Brownlee swing and Free Child was there in the area, couldn't quite get his hand on it, but there to finish in the red zone and secure the hold here for Sakai. You know this is an emotional game for Dylan, as most of them are. He is a fiery player. Won the Callahan at the University of Oregon in 2013. Represented the United States of America at the World Games in Poland a couple years ago, where he was teammates with, among others, Jimmy Mickle, Chris Kotcher, Grant Lindsley, all his opponents today. He and Jimmy Mickle go way, way back. They're very close friends and very fierce rivals, if both can be true, which they are. Yeah, that dates back to their college days when they competed together on the Next Gen Ultimate Tour, a, a pioneering concept at the time. Kevin Minderhout loading up a bus with a bunch of college ultimate stars, launching his own broadcast outfit and taking the futures of the sport around the country to play the best club teams in the country. And I think that was some unparalleled experience for guys like Thorne and Freechild and Kotcher and Mickle, who are all big players in this game now. And aside from creating great ultimate content and creating friendships, it also created superstars. I mean, it introduced the world to the dynamic abilities of Mickle and Freechild and Kotcher and at a very young age, right? Here's Lindsley launching deep again. Good shot to Kotcher, who beat Mitch Kolzak to the deep space. We are still on serve. The Pony offense remains perfect. I just can't get enough of these one-on-one -on -one matchups. Trent Dillon on Grant Lindsley. So much speed, so much quickness on display there. And again, we're, we're seeing Grant make Seattle pay more as a thrower than as a receiver. Lindsley and Kotcher, two more USA World Games teammates. Two of the seven guys that went to Poland to represent the US. Chris Kotcher, when he was in sixth grade, he had his vision set on becoming an NBA basketball player. He said he had great success in his sixth grade church league. By eighth grade, he realized he might be a little delusional about how he was at basketball and attending the Paideia School in Atlanta, a program known for its ultimate Frisbee. He joined the team and of course, Grant Lindsley, who threw that score, a Paideia product as well. Got to meet Michael Baccarini this spring, the longtime coach, creator of Paideia Ultimate. One of the Hall of Famers of the sport. He's molded so many great players across multiple divisions as we've seen this weekend. No question. And he was molding players back at a time when high school ultimate was rare. Now it's much more common as we see at an event like the U.S. Open where hundreds of teams from around the country come to compete in the U-17 and U-20 divisions. It's, it's tantalizing to think about what the youth players are gonna look like five, 10 years from now. Grant Lindsley crossing over here for this D point and taking the Dylan Free Child assignment. Chris Kotcher as well. Kotcher's on Kasednar. Jack Hatchet on Raider. Reset for Free Child. Quick dish for Kasednar. Handler is trying to do most of the work. Montague from the front of the stack. And to Raider for the score. Beating Conrad Schlor to the spot. Raiders got his second score and we're tied at five. I wish I knew what the answer was for marking Simon Montague in the red zone. We talked about this earlier. He's just so lanky, so aggressive, so proficient. I mean, you can say that you're gonna commit to a force, but he's gonna find a way to break the mark no matter what, right there, it's just a step through backhand. You know, past times, we've seen him 
fake that around backhand and then off balance step back across his body and throw the inside flick when he's got the defender moved. He's just so comfortable even in unorthodox throwing situations. Mentioned earlier that sockeye coach David Hogan has been preaching patience throughout the tournament. Says that the defensive alignments downfield are designed to create uncertainty. And if we're patient, we'll be fine. And the stats illustrate the good execution of the game plan because Sakai is five for five in the red zone. All five of their goals in the red zone. The only turnover came on the attempted huck into double coverage where Raider got his hand on it but could not haul it in. I think we need to give Coach Hogan an earpiece <laughs> so that he can just use this as his halftime intel briefing. There's David Hogan, longtime Pittsburgh assistant, moved out to Seattle a couple years ago. It's a bright, ultimate strategy mind. Down on the sidelines, bearing the heat, our own Megan Torming. Thanks, Evan. Listen, both teams are absolutely itching for that break opportunity and are trying to amp up their D lines in order to do that. Pony was just preaching to one another, we've got to get down on the pole, we've got to get down on the pole. And earlier, Sakai was saying, our D is playing a little bit scared. It's understandable, but we got to amp it up. Back to you. Christian Foster prepared to pull. He and Jack Hatchett were on a D-line together for a long time, Boston Ironside. The now defunct perennial semifinalist that took the 2016 title in dramatic fashion. One of the interesting stories in the men's club division is what is Boston Ultimate gonna look like? Because literally for a decade, every single year they made it to the semifinals, it was a guarantee. Last year, the one, in a couple years, multiple teams from Boston qualified for Nationals. Last year, just one team, Boston Dig, they finished dead last at Nationals. How will Boston Ultimate respond in 2019? I've said this before. There's a great 30 for 30 to be produced on Boston Men's Ultimate. The great death or glory franchise. Free child first throw after the turnover hits Trent Dillon. And the it has been scratched. The Dylan Dylan connection. Free child to Trent. Sockeye lead 6 5. Seattle Sockeye with a lead for the first time today at 6 5. An errant throw from Pony. Early in the possession, Keegan too high for Thorne, and it didn't take long for Sockeye to capitalize. And Dylan Freechild absolutely fired up after breaking Jimmy Mickle's mark to throw this goal, running away from him, clapping at him, and letting him know that it's on. The first break of the game, Dylan Freechild crosses over, plays a deep point, and gets the result. It's still a little jarring, I don't know about for you, but for me to see Free Child in the Sockeye jersey, considering he was a, a, a vehement spokesman anti-Seattle for a long time when he played for Portland Rhino, has had a long rivalry with the University of Washington and is an Oregon product, but last year made the decision. Really has, I don't want to say become the face of the franchise, but to deny him that title. Yeah, World Games talent is instantly be gonna become the top of your depth chart. Mikkel looking for Kotcher, and he read it well, despite Kolzak being right there. Mitch Kolzak needed to turn around and look back at the disc, and he might have had himself a block. Well, it was a quick hold for Pony, but it wasn't a clean one. You can see Kolzak had an opportunity to make a play on the disc. This is a connection that works. Mickle to Kotcher deep. 
But with our armchair quarterbacking and hindsight, you know, perhaps Kotcher was a little bit too deep at the moment of release, but, you know, typically I'm sure Brian Jones wants to see that goal caught in stride. And I'm sure Jimmy Mickle made some kind of calculation in his mind. Hey, even if this throw is slightly off, I have confidence in this matchup. Back into the shade they go. In between games, walking around the facility, it's a beautiful day in the shade. Cool, comfortable, pleasant. On the turf, it feels like you're in the middle of a sauna when that sun is shining bright. For the moment, the clouds are helping everybody out. In, in the midst of that level one heat advisory that's forcing us to take some extra water breaks throughout the course of this game. Preachild was calling for the disc, didn't get it. Montague takes the reset to Murray. Sam Little chasing Simon Montague around. Here's Janet. Free child. Look at the extension on the release point. Right by his ankle, he let it go to get it around the mark. And Jannon. Sakai remains unbroken in this game. And that continues as Dylan scores again and spikes this one with authority. So fun to watch these offenses go back and forth, point after point. Pony so committed to that central vertical stack that leaves a lot of space on both sides of its stack. Sakai more interested in using that horizontal stack, spread stack. Sometimes it looks like a side stack when players are consolidated on the dead side, but they do such a good job of continuing to bounce the disc laterally across that horizontal stack when those little windows open up. So Montague dishes for Dylan to make it 7-6. Halftime is at eight. And since Pony received to start the first half, Sockeye with a chance here, if they could break, they would take half 8-6 and then they would receive to start the second half. Winner of this game earns $2,000. The first leg of the Triple Crown Tour. To win the Triple Crown, you gotta win the US Open here in Minnesota, the Pro Championships, which will be Labor Day weekend just outside of Philadelphia, and then the National Championships late October in San Diego. Pride of New York won the Triple Crown last year, and it started right here at the US Open. With an impressive win over Ring of Fire in the semis, and then they beat the hometown team Minneapolis Sub-Zero in the finals. Sub-Zero had beaten San Francisco Revolver, the defending national champs, in a shocking semifinal result to meet Pony in the final game. Here's Lindsley. This is William Dean. Ben Snell bouncing on the mark. Over to Keegan. Pass the bidding catch to Lindsley. And now Keegan's taken off. Launching, looking for Mickle, but it's easily picked off by the soaring Julian Hausman. Third turnover for Pony. Sockeye with just one. And Sockeye indeed does have a chance to take half and really seize control of this game. Grant definitely wanted a little more juice on that one. It looks like this stoppage was due to a misheard or a misunderstood injury call. Disc in the hands of Eli Friedman. Former teammates with Grant Lindsley on revolver. 
Snell to Hausman. Nickel on the mark. Needs a reset. Kolzak moves the disc. Sockeye veteran Duncan Lynn. Deep shot flies. Friedman ain't going to get there. And you see the speed from Lindsley closing the gap, accelerating past Friedman. He made up so much ground in so little time. Friedman did have a step, but it's almost it's almost Billy, like one side. of those Drive same third throws that coaches often Inside. preach against. Now, a little now, different, now, but now, just a tough window now, there. Nickel bluffs a big flick. Low laser go. hung onto by Dean. That was a tough catch Mitch, on the run. Under, 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 under. Big swing. Snell under, thought under, about under, the bid, but good angle. Under. And now the continue for Thorne. It's Kotcher. He's got Keegan open, but he had no throwing lane. And Christian you're, you're Foster through, just got the thrower guarding blue card. That's a double team. Here we go, here we go. A blue card is effectively a warning. Did you call double team? Yeah, I just okay, I, mean, so I mean I didn't call double team, but I stopped playing. Okay, we, we have a we have a double team. We have a, stop. We have a double team call. We have a double team call. What was your number? You said four, so we're saying three. We're saying let's let's de-escalate. Okay, let's. We're all, hey guys, everybody, we're all good now. We're all good now. Come in three. Don't do slip. And Chris Kotcher has a point. Eli, ready for swings. Eli, ready for swings. If Christian Foster can be there and be passing by the mark yeah. and stick his hand out and not touch the disc for just a split second. Seems like good defense. That, that's, that's heads up defense. That's help defense. We're good here. We're good here. However, if okay. he's initiating contact with Kotcher and Kotcher's not his assignment, even if he is initiating contact and Kotcher's his assignment, that is a foul. Foster's chasing his guy, and it runs him by Kotcher, and he's able to be an extra defender on the mark. Smart defense. Mickle to Keegan. Ties us. Seven up. Jimmy Mickle immediately goes to Trent Dillon, asking him to talk to one of his Sockeye teammates, and then Mike Caldwell, the coach, comes in wow. and basically says, what go was away. That? I want you to talk to me. I want you to talk to me right now. I saw what happened. I disagree. I, I agree that you should that you should talk to them. But you're pursuing somebody with an elevated start. Let's just let's calm down. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No, I know. I know. Yep. You see the observers trying to de-escalate the tension. Right after the point, Mikkel trying to talk to Dylan, and then Caldwell kind of waves him away with a notebook. And Mitch Dengler, the head of the USAU observers, steps in. Timeout called, one more point before we get to half. You know, I, I I see both sides of this. You know, Jimmy feels like there's a lot of physicality being initiated, and defenders on Sockeye and Truck Stop yesterday feel, hey, this is the level of defense and the le level of physicality that we've generally accepted in the game. Most recently. I'm sorry, I just it didn't look dirty. Well, Kotcher is saying it's a double team. If Foster is chasing his man who brings him through there, then it's not a double team. But if the guy he's guarding is nowhere around, then that becomes an illegal play. And it is a fine line and a fine distinction. 
and we were too zoomed in there to see how close Foster was to his offensive cutter. After the timeout, you're going to see Grant Lindsley, Chris Kocher, and Jimmy Mickle out there. And here's the, the wider angle. And yeah, that, that's a double team. Isn't it? I, I would agree. And, and it was also a foul because he initiated contact with Kocher in the throwing motion. Pony's got all of their top defenders on the field. Nickel is on Raider, and the deep shot goes up to nobody. 20. Patience lacking there from Montague. That's the third turnover for Sockeye, the sixth turnover of the game. Nickel saying his cleat exploded, wondering if there's any kind of substitution he can take, but he can't. Well, you can call an equipment timeout, but Mickel's first throw intended for Hatchet was a bad one. And then a foul call downfield as Kasednar's throw hit the turf. Contested now? No contest. I mean, if Mickel's cleat exploded, you can take an equipment timeout and either get your equipment repaired or leave the field. I don't know if I've ever seen Jimmy turf a flick like that before. Up the line, looking to Montague. It's out of bounds. And Jabron Mieser with another block in a big spot for Pony. Dangerous situation. Equipment or in? It's a date. We're clarifying that. Yes, and if you want to sub a team, sub someone. Let's see if we can see what happened to Jimmy's cleat. Here's the sockeye shot to the end zone. Where were you? Beezer made the block. I'm not sure Montague had a chance to touch that inbounds anyway. There's a lot going on right now here. In. This, is, this is the intensity that we only get to see a few times a year. I love it. Snell came in for Sockeye, a one-for-one one sub defensively, and goodness, what is are you kidding? Lindsley just turfed a flick after Nickel turfed a flick. Is that disc okay? Four turns on this point. Raider to Snell, to Montague. Mieser leaping on the mark. You can see Kotcher just peeling off his assignment in the stack in the end zone, just helping as much as he can. Trying to poach off again. It's Murray. And he hits Raider right in the bread basket. Sockeye able to take half, up a break, 8-7 over Pony. What a wild final point. We had five turnovers in the first 14 points of the game and then four on that final sequence to end the half. Just some uncharacteristic performance from Mickel and Lindsley. Lindsley with a couple turnovers in this half. If you can call that last point a battle of attrition, Sakai with the early edge there. There were no turns in the first seven points. There were five turns in the next seven points. There were four turns in that final point. It's 8 7 Sakai at the half. Megan Tormey has pony coach Everybody, Brian Jones. We would like to take a minute Thanks, to Evan. The athletes Brian, you had a few opportunities but didn't quite capitalize. What are you going to tell the, the defensive unit when These they're on offense? Absolutely nothing. I mean, Jimmy Mickle and Grant Lindsley miss a flick. It's not going to happen that often. It's an aberration. There's nothing more to say to them. They're going to lock in the second half. 
We took a while to find defensive pressure. I like what we did at we'll the end of the second, uh, first half there. Hopefully it's say, uh, we can keep ramping it up in the second half. The if you could division, replay that last point forward, again where there were four turns, the previously there had been only five the in the game, what would you do differently? Nothing. Just hope that they complete the flick, really. I mean, that's it comes down to it. We just Those are great players. Those are aberrations. They're going to make them in the second half. Well, in the second half, you guys are going to have to dig deeper to try and generate more opportunities. Is there anything different you're going to do in the second half? Yeah, in the second half, we need to be loose at the beginning and smart with our poaches to prevent the big plays, but then we need to tighten up. We're not getting enough reset pressure whatsoever on them, and which is why they've had a fairly easy time once they get past half field. We've had some good points. We need to be better in the second half. Well, thanks for an exciting first half. Good luck in the second. Thank you. And back to you, Evan. Brian Jones channeling his inner Bill Belichick with the hoodie. The hoodie cutoff certainly elaborates more than Bill. 8-7 Sockeye at the half. The 2019 USA Ultimate US Open, the middle game of our championship triple header, the men's final with Sockeye leading Pony 8-7. Seattle with the game's only break, the offenses were crisp early. A few close calls, but for the most part, this was an offense-dominated first half. Yeah, Pony favoring that center vertical stack, attacking with those lanes on either side of the stack. Sakai favoring that horizontal spread set more frequently, except when they get in the red zone. You'll see some of these offhand backhands and inside breaks really making the Pony defense pay. Grant Lindsley successful on his first couple of hucks, but maybe Pony got a little huck happy late in the half. It led to a couple turnovers. Yeah, they started taking some looks that didn't have the same separation that we were seeing earlier in the half. There were multiple defenders in the area. These guys are smart enough to know, in retrospect, what's a great look, where they may have mis-executed. But a couple opportunities that they want back. This was one of Lindsley's on-the-money shots. Lindsley to Contra there made it 5-4 Pony. But then a 2-0 run. This was the break. First throw after the turn. Keegan overshooting Thorne a bit. Free child to Dylan for the lead. That shot from Mikkel to Kodger tied it at six all. And both teams had plenty of chances in on the final couple of points of the half. In fact, after just three turnovers in the first 13 points of the game, there were six in the final two points of the half. Sockeye takes half with Murray finding Raider to lead 8-7. Sockeye receives when we start the second half here in Minnesota at the U.S. Open. Welcome back to Blaine, Minnesota. We are halfway through the men's final of the 2019 U.S. Open. Sockeye is up 8-7 over Pony, and that one point difference comes down to the one break that you have scored. Coach David Hogan, tell me a little bit about what you were aiming to do that play where you got the D and then the score. We really just wanted to make that point hard on them and just make them throw a lot of throws, have a lot of pressure, tough marks going into the wind. Um, they had a lot of points that were five to seven throws really quick, and that's, that's tough for us to let them keep airing it out like that. So first and foremost, take that away, and then you know they popped one up, and, and we, we made it count real quick. Any thoughts on the on the Mitch Kulzak double team that led to a bit of flustered play from both teams? It happens. Um, you know that's that's going to happen a lot at this level. We you know I think that's just a thing that occurs in the sport when people are trying. If there's clarification, there's communication. We're talking about what we're okay with doing, what we're not okay with doing. As long as there's a good resolution, people are going to break the rules. And as long as you go forward in a good space, that's totally fine. The last point four turnovers besides that very perfect play from both sides and the onus is now on you to remain perfect what do you do to to prime your team for what's necessary in the second half uh it's just re reinstilling our confidence in ourselves and our ability to possess the disc um to beat this team you have to play perfect offensively we've made four bad choices and they were all turnovers and you know this could easily be them up eight to six or eight to five and we have to continue understanding spacing, understanding where their defense is over pressuring, and not feed into what they want us to do. 
Um, so keeping our options open, being dyma dynamic, being versatile, and being calm and poised, knowing it's on them to take the disc from us, not on us to score. All right, well, we will see who can be more poised and perfect in the second half. Thanks for your time. Stick with us. The exciting conclusion of this game coming up. Second half ready to go here at the men's final at the 2019 U.S. Open. Jimmy Mickle beginning the second half on the sideline, and that's exactly where the pull goes. A roller forcing Sockeye to begin from the sideline, and Montague gets a centering pass to Phil Murray, who's picked up by Marquez Brownlee. Low throw, dug up nicely by Jacob Janin. Now Dylan Freechild underneath to Chris Kasednar. Ian Toner, do you think the more patient team is going to win this game? Certainly. We've seen how how much those few turnovers in the first half have cost Pony. We'll see if Sakai can really take advantage with this extra quasi break here coming out of halftime. And look, all these throwers are capable. You're on national TV, you get the disc. You want to look to the end zone and be the hero and hit an open guy with a beautiful throw. These guys have been trying to train themselves to think differently than that and take the easy, conservative 99.9% .9 shot 99.9% .9 of the time. And as we saw in the first half, sometimes the execution, even on that appropriate decision, has been failing. But Sakai, Looking much smoother here. Attacking that short strike space frequently once they got into the attacking half of the field. Maddie Russell catches another goal for Sockeye. Makes it 9-7 out of the half. In the first half, Pony turned it five times. Sockeye turned it four times. In the men's semi yesterday between Pony and Truck, there were only 11 combined turnovers in the entire game. With Pony winning 14-10 over the top club team from Washington, D.C. Whirling pull from Foster. He's known to have some of the best pulls in the game, and that's another good one forcing Pony to start in its own end zone and great defensive coverage from Sockeye. Garvey gets the reset high in the stall count to Keegan. Still in the end zone, but a different look for Lindsley. Kick downfield with D.Y. Chen Marking Alex Thorne. Pony still in its own end zone here. Closing in on 26 minutes away from the soft cat. When the clock expires, you add two to the higher team's score. And that would be the new destination if we're not already on track to get to 15. Garvey, Thorne, and Keegan trying to stay composed in the backfield. Ben now, ben now, ben now. What are you seeing from Sockeye's defense downfield? Not a lot of helping. Deep shot goes up, Mickle is there. That's right, that's right. And the Pony offense converts with a half field shot to Jimmy Mickle. When Pony was in its own end zone and his handlers had their backs up against the wall, I saw some more helping from the Sockeye defenders, but once Pony was able to get the disc up toward midfield, swing it, find those lateral options, it looked like the Sockeye defenders tried to zero in and clamp down on their one-on-one -on -one matchups. And this is just Jimmy Mickle going up the break side and a really expert throw, putting it in Mickle's bread basket. Hard to, hard to fault Julian Hausman too much on that point. Yeah. Well, the you know first 
60 seconds of the point, Sockeye's downfield defense wasn't enabling any of the pony cutters to get open. Back into the shade for the pony O-line and it's Sockeye's turn to get back on offense. Brian Jones orchestrating the matchups. Pony with Raider, Kasednar, Russell, Jannon, Montague, Free Child, and Bryce Dixon. Dixon University of Arizona product. Sakai trying to double its lead again. Sakai trying to also win its second tournament of the year after winning the Colorado Cup. Raiders shooting it for Free Child. Will it come back in bounds? Free Child lands in. Conrad Schlor was closing in. And Free Child had to make a choice to try to greatest this one or keep that Feet in bounds. Tremendous footwork from Free Child. Sakai converts by a pretty thin margin. Second half of the men's final, Seattle. Back at the 2019 U.S. Open. Matt Rader with a daring shot here, and Dylan Free Child saved him a bit. This is one of those same third shots that can be a little risky at times, that coaches can coach against, but Raider and Free Child, so much experience playing with each other, so much confidence and understanding of their timing, able to convert that hold there. Hard to tell a guy who's in his 12th year on the team to dial back the decision making. Raider likes to take that shot. Keegan slides, maintains possession. And he's fouled by Eli Friedman, or so it appeared, on the attempted backhand break. Alex Bader, Alex Bader. Hey, you... Dean, Lindsley, Kotcher, Mickle, and Thorne downfield with Garvey joining Keegan in the end zone. Duncan Lynn laid out, got some disc, perhaps also got some of the body. Come in one. No contest on the foul. Lindsley to Dean. Oh, and Dean turns it over, trying to reset to Garvey. Seattle looking to stretch its lead to three, which would be its biggest of the game. Friedman lays out to maintain possession. Here's John Randolph, the superstar, just finished his sophomore year at Brown University with a national title. And there's Ben Snell, who won a college title at UNC, catching the goal from the former Callahan winner, Eli Friedman. 11-8 Seattle. And again, you know, you got to give credit to Sakai applying pressure and not making things easy for Pony, but look at some of the most costly turnovers that Pony has had this game. I'm thinking back to that point just before halftime where both Jimmy Mickle and Grant Lindsley turfed wide open flicks. Look at this reset where William Dean just misses an open swing reset pass that he probably completes. Nine times out of 10, it's Pony is failing in the execution department. And Sakai is applying the right amount of pressure and credit to them for capitalizing on these opportunities. They're two for three on break chances to that point. Friedman finding Snell. And Snell, a fascinating story. He's staying out on the field. Number 77 on one knee. 
When he initially tried out for the Sockeye team, he was cut. Didn't make the team, but persevered, got in great shape, tried out again. He's now a captain orchestrating the defense. And he's become a guy that has been on the field during universe point situations on their top D line. Full play on Friday. Friday, Chicago Machine took Seattle Universe Point, in which Sockeye broke to win. And a loft kilter catch of the pull there by Garvey. This feels like a, a must score point for New York. Sockeye with some great defensive downfield pressure again. Sam Little shakes free. Go GY, go GY. Under, 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 go go. Keegan rips a flick. And Lindsley rises up. To Little. Well, you could see the fatigue being a factor there for that Pony offense. So many players staying out after getting broken and there was good stack discipline in spacing, but the cutting volume wasn't as aggressive and it wasn't as frequent. Took a long time for that deep opportunity to materialize from the right area. We saw some of the deep cuts or attempted deep cuts starting from too deep earlier in the point. So Lindsley to Little to make it 11-9. And Brian Jones trying to orchestrate Pony's first break of the game. Sockeyes O-line has turned it over three times, Ian, but the New York D-line 0 for 3 on conversion tries. Jones from Ian Toner territory, upstate New York. He started coaching college ultimate. Became really passionate about figuring out new strategies. And I mean, he's talked about how he has personally spent years trying to decipher a game plan to beat Revolver. He got his opportunity in the grand stage last year. And goodness, Pony was unbelievable. And how they limited Revolver made the San Francisco offense, which was usually so dominant, look so uncomfortable. The rest of the 2019 season might be about trying to stop Seattle as Raider shoots it to Dixon. Shy of the end zone. Quizon Tice running with him. And floating it across the front line, it's Montague. <laughs> Seattle Sockeye closing in, up by three, within three points of a U.S. Open title. Back at the men's final, the 2019 U.S. Open. There's only been one turnover in the second half. It led to the Sockeye break that made it 11-8. This Dixon to Montague Crossfield flick. Made it 12-9. Great presence of mind and patience by Dixon. Those situations when you're all alone and the rest of the players are catching up to you can escalate in pressure very quickly but he's calm enough to find Montague streaking over towards the middle of the field. Doesn't force anything into that tight front corner space and ends up throwing the assist. It's been a very impressive 21 points so far for Seattle Sockeye. See if they can close it out. Christian Foster unwinds and uncorks another monster pull a little confusion there for who's going to scoop it up garvey to thorn but still in the end zone met by foster lynn poaches into the lane and we got a, a spread horizontal look 
from the Pony offense. Hadn't seen a lot or much at all of that earlier in this game. Again, Foster poaches off. Lindsley launches deep. He's got Thorne with Foster chasing. Alex Thorne with Hausman there as well. And a couple of Pittsburgh products meet in the end zone. Thorne hauls it in for Pony. Thorne and Hausman so instrumental in Pittsburgh and Sabaneur's college championships earlier in the decade. Great hustle by Hausman making up so much ground. Thorne clearly was not his assignment. That's the kind of help defense that coaches love to see. Fourth assist for Lindsley. Alex Thorne in his first season with Pony as well. And those two guys, Lindsley and Thorne, seem to have found a pretty quick chemistry. It's amazing when you think about it, because two years ago, this Pony roster didn't have Jimmy Mickle or Grant Lindsley or Alex Thorne or Bo Kittredge, who will join the team most likely later on this year. And the addition of those guys have gotten some other guys like Marquez Brownlee and Gibran Mieser, adding them into the Pony fold, inspiring them to play, adding to the team's depth. Here in the finals though, Sakai has been crisper overall. Still hard to believe that one point where both Mikkel and Lindsley turf the flick. Montague rips it deep. Raider battling with Hatchet. What a catch by Raider, shy of the goal line. Floats it dangerously over Jannon. But Mieser, all he could do is watch that disc sail over his head. And it's 13-10, Sakai answers quickly. Well, Jack Hatchet made up the ground in the air and you could see him make a calculated decision. Am I gonna stay on the inside shoulder or am I gonna try and go backside? And you saw him consciously go to Raiders backside intentionally, thinking he could hold that position and push Raider too far under the disc. But on this one, Raider emerges victorious. And Hatchet a phenomenal athlete, but he's given up about four inches in that Raider matchup. Raider involved in five of the 13 Sockeye scores. Two goals, three ass uh, two assists and three goals. For a guy who was a, a track and field athlete at Laverne College on the West Coast. Started playing ultimate at a very young age. Has always been one of the nuclear athletes in the sport. And again, it, it's amazing, I don't know about you Ian, but the think Raider is just 27. Mm -hmm. He's been around for 12 years playing at the highest level. And like theoretically, 27, 28, 29 is when you're entering your athletic prime. And we're seeing him utilize that prime with crabs like that over Hatchet. Here's Garvey looking for Mickel. That's a gorgeous throw, and Jimmy has the easy catch, beating Snell to the deep space. 13-11. And this is gonna come down to whether Pony can force a turn or two from the Seattle offense. Still only one turn in the entire second half. That's why Harper Garvey is on this offensive line. He's a gunslinger with a quick release who can push that disc to the deep space quicker than anyone. First assist for Garvey who has been playing a little bit more conservatively than he has in the past. 
see Mickle staying out there on defense. Lindsley as well. Kotcher two. Just ho-hum, you add three of the top seven male players in the world according to the USA World Games roster. Onto your D-line for a point at 13-11 when you're down and needing to make something happen. Hatchet, Little. Looks like Haskell and Schlor out there as well. They got three USA World Games guys, along with a couple University of Georgia products and Little and Haskell with Hatchet and Schlor. Mickle taking the Raider matchup. Here's Jannon with Schlor on him. Up the line for Kasednar. Free child, acrobatic grab. Sakai continuing to just gradually maneuver forward. Pony not getting all that close to a block. Jannon. Denied the shot up the line. Montague takes the reset. Breaking the mark for Raider. There was a switch during the point. Now Hatchet on Raider. Montague to the end zone past the bidding Haskell. Sockeye within one score of a U.S. Open title as Kasednar hauls in the score. Clinical side stack offense there from this Sockeye offensive unit. Earlier in that point, doing such a good job keeping defenders not involved in the play on the dead space and forcing Pony defenders into really difficult isolation one-on-one -on -one spots where they don't have the opportunity to get help. Could Montague be any more casual in a pressure situation? Just ho-hum, launch, walks away. That's his demeanor as a thrower and a leader and a central handler on this team. Timeout was taken by Pony. Presumably wanting to rest their top players for this pivotal offensive point. There's only been two breaks in the entire game. We're tied 5-5 with only two turnovers in those first 10 points. And then the free child to Trent Dillon shot after the Keegan overthrow made it 6-5. A couple missed opportunities for Pony late in the first half. They had chances to break. Uncharacteristic mistakes from their stars. It was 8-7, Sockeye at half, and Seattle made it 9-7 with an offensive hold to start the second half. They went up 11-8 on the Ben Snell to Eli Friedman break. And since then, we've been trading back and forth. Up by two or up by three. No turns in the second half except for the one mishap on the reset from Dean when he was looking for Garvey. Six straight turnover, free points. Nine of the 10 points in the half. And after being involved in our, as I check our unofficial stats here, and I believe four of Pony's first half goals, Sean Keegan hasn't been on the stat sheet here in the second half. Keegan is out there on the field with Thorne, Mickle, Lindsley. Dean, Garvey, and Kotcher. Certainly one name that will likely be on this Pony O-line later in the season is the former University of Minnesota national champion, big man Ben Yacht. He was a critical piece on the Pony O-line a year ago. Foster to pull, must score for Pony. And a rare error on the launch from Foster. Sets up Keegan at the brick mark. Foster known as one of the better, if not the best, puller in the men's division. And Able again, to 
the, the expiration of the clock, fairly inconsequential. It's a game to 15. If Pony could come back and tie it at 14, then it would become a game to 16, win by two. Keegan to Cotter. Under! Under! Back to Keegan. And now Garvey. Pick call downfield. Julian Hausman trying to stick to Jimmy Mickle like glue in the stack. Sockeye trying to close out what has been a, a really incredibly impressive performance. Pony looking to stay alive. Looking for Mickle. He had a couple steps on Hausman and another throw right on the money. Makes it 14-12. And now Pony will try to do what they haven't done all game, which is break the Sockeye offense. They need to do it three times to come back and win. A tall task ahead of them. Harper Garvey trying to make things as easy as possible with a nice finish. You can see his throwing prowess on display here. Pony's got one timeout that it can use at some point. The question is how much do these world game stars and other O-line players get double shifted. And Sakai's got the luxury of just playing its lines at its regular cadence because it performed well enough to earn that comfort at the moment in this game. Nickel staying out there on defense. It's Little, Mickle, Lindsley, Mieser, Kocher, Joshua Steven Stein. And Jack Hatchett getting ready to pull at the other end. Raider with Free Child. Montague ever steady. Matty Russell, Jacob Jannon, Bryce Dixon. Along with Phil Murray for Seattle Sockeye. Looking to close out a U.S. Open title. It would be their second. Underneath, Raider. Thought about the deep shot for Janin. Instead resets for Montague. Former Carlton star, dishes to Murray. Raider again, calmly distributes to Russell. Here's Free Child. Only two breaks in the entire game, both from Seattle, has Sakai in position to wrap up the US Open Championship right here. Montague breaks the mark, and Murray shoots it to Free Child, and that will end it. Sakai unbroken from the opening pull to the final score. 15-12 over Pony, Seattle Sockeye, the 2019 U.S. Open champ. A breathtaking offensive performance by this Sockeye squad. Their second U.S. Open title in three years. And Evan, I think they've cemented themselves at the top of the power rankings and the top of the seedings as we head into the final stretch of the regular season now. There's no question about it. Statement made by Seattle, not just because they won, but the way they won. Opportunistically taking advantage on a couple of break chances. Free child to Dylan and Friedman to Snell. The breaks made it 6-5 and 11-8, and the Sockeye offense was perfect down the stretch. Final score, 15-12.
We'll have post-game reaction here from Minnesota after this. USA Ultimate US Open Club Championships are presented by Spin Ultimate, providing custom team uniforms and ultimate apparel since 2007. Visit Spin Ultimate on the web at spinultimate.com. By the Ultimate History Book, illuminating the legendary stories, moments, and photos from the sport of ultimate over the past 50 years. Learn more at ultimatehistorybook.com. And by Discraft, home of the Ultra Star, the official disc of USA Ultimate. Now featuring an updated website to make ordering custom discs easier than ever. Visit Discraft.com for all your custom disc needs. Final score at the 2019 US Open in the men's division. Seattle Sockeye 15, New York Pony 12. Last year's Triple Crown winner goes down in the first leg of the 2019 Triple Crown Tour. Sockeye's Simon Montague standing by with our Megan Tormey. Thanks so much, Evan. Simon, I saw you chatting with your team in your post-game huddle. What were you saying to your teammates? You know, this is just uh, one step for us. Um, we know that uh, when we play our best, we can beat any team in the country, and we know that when we don't play our best, we can lose to any team. And so for us, this is a uh, confidence to put in the back pocket, but knowing that we got to stay hungry, this isn't our ultimate goal. Uh, it's just a step in the right direction. Coming into this game, Pony talked about how important defense was against your squad. So they were giving you everything they could defensively. What were you seeing, and how were you able to take advantage of it? Uh, Pony's a great defensive team. They have a lot of different looks that they can throw. Um, our number one goal is to stay patient and hit, hit open hands. Um, we know that if we need to throw 30 passes to score a goal, we can do that, uh, no pressure, and that our mistakes come when we choose to try and rush it. So we were just focusing on ourselves, cutting hard, clearing hard, and waiting to see what got open and throwing it to it. In the second half, you gave yourself a little bit of breathing room, but all the same, the opportunities were so few that the pressure had to be mounting on the offensive line to remain perfect. You guys are no strangers to tough games. All the same, how do you remain calm when the pressure mounts as it did today? We talked before this game about how the best defense we face all year is our own defense back at home on our practice fields. And likewise, you know, our defense is practicing against what we feel is the best offensive team in the country. And so we take confidence from that. You know, we've spent the last month, the last three months practicing against our D-line. And we feel that if we take every hit they take and can grow from that, that when we come out here, we're feeling great going against a different team. Well, go thank your D-line players for making you look so great today. Congratulations on a great win. Thanks, Megan. Back to you, Evan. Megan, Simon, thank you so much. Ten total turnovers in the game. Sockeye made just four of them. It was not a flawless performance, but almost perfect. Seattle was great today. Yeah, I loved the way they utilized their side stack, the way they utilized their horizontal and spread stack, just pushing defenders into tight isolation spaces, limiting opportunities to help against them. There's a long way to go before we get to Nationals in San Diego in October. But what do you think about Simon Montague's statement that they not only have the best offense in the country, but Sockeye might have the best defense in the country? Is that possible? I think it is possible. I think they just took down what last year proved was the best offense in the country, and things change. Players develop, coaches change, there are new systems installed, and right now Sockeye is sitting at the top of that ranking. Pony wants to get its full roster, wants to add Ben Yacht and Ben Katz and Bo Kittredge and Jeff Babbitt. Those four guys could change the dynamic a little bit, but today Sockeye was superior. 15-12 over Pony. We'll wrap it up in a moment. Seattle Sockeye with our Discraft play of the game. At this point, it was 9-8. Matt Rader with a dangerous shot that Dylan Freechild keeps inbounds in the end zone. This makes the score 10 to eight. And then one point later, the only turnover of the second half, William Dean errantly looking for Harper Garvey. Sockeye quickly capitalizes and they go up 11-8, they win 15-12. That was the sequence of the game. The efficiency of Seattle Sockeye's D-line offense, just embarrassing Pony by comparison when you look at how those two units performed over the course of the game. Seattle Sockeye, the 2019 U.S. Open Ultimate Champions. Megan Tormey down in the field with Sockeye coach David Hogan. Thank you very much, Evan. Actually, I'm now joined by Mike Caldwell. Thanks for taking a moment to chat with us. Um, you know, coming into this game, I understand that you were looking to define roles for players. Based on the performance you saw today, are you changing anyone up? Are they, have you made any decisions about specific players? 
Uh, based on today, no. Uh, we made a change or two coming into today. Um, this weekend has given us some of the highest pressure stages that we've experienced yet this year. And those are the stages on which we really want to compete and you know, it can show one thing or another. So we made an adjustment or two coming in, uh, moved some people around a little bit. Um, there was really pretty, uh, not very much of that. Um, so people will, knew what was in store for them when they showed up today. What were some of the changes that you made this weekend that you were so pleased with? Um, what we worked on a lot between the, our last tournament and this tournament Ladies was and creating space on offense uh, and working as a team banner. overall. Um, of one of our goals throughout the weekend was to set the table for your teammates, uh, whether it was on defense day. and in performing your assignment so that someone else could contribute well, or on offense, creating room for your teammate USA to get the disc. Um, and overall, I'm Carolina pretty pleased Gonzalez with the way that Giannis. came out. Uh, overall, obviously USA today was a great result. Um, we've got a lot of uh, room ahead of us to grow, so I'm excited. Yeah, certainly you have to keep your eyes ahead. This is just the beginning First, of the Triple Crown Tour. What do you see as the upper Remember echelon the for Seattle Sakai this year? It's difficult to say. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I think we've exceeded uh, my expectations anyway thus far. Uh, it's a difficult balance to strike uh, between staying in the moment uh, and using these stages as rehearsals for uh, the end of the year and the championship um, versus like playing them off too light and just having fun, which can be great for development but doesn't really prepare you for the end goal. Um, our goal as coaches and captains and players has been to sort of ride that line, um, be in the moment, um, care about outcomes, be emotionally invested in what's happening and emotionally invested in each other, um, but still keep things in context and know that um, we're going to continue to grow and continue to evolve. So how do you maintain that intensity in the practices and the days and the weeks to come so that you can see a similar result at nationals this year? Um, well, the team's really hungry, uh, which is great. I mean, they were ready to keep playing at the end of that game, which is like generally what you want to see if you're in my position. Um, our practices end up being really intense. We push each other really hard, uh, and we're, we're fond of saying that those are some of the hardest games that we play uh, are on Saturdays, Saturdays and Sundays in Seattle. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're going to continue to learn together as a team. Uh, Conquering the unknown simply in terms of things that you're learning together can really help keep things fresh and keep a team cohesive as a shared experience. Um, beyond that, we're just going to have to figure it out as we go. Well, congratulations on the win. Good luck staying hungry. It was fun to watch Sakai play today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Back to you, Evan. Impressive performance from Mike Caldwell's team. He was a, a legend as a player and highly regarded as a leader. Now in a coaching role, pretty measured reaction, but this has to be a satisfying victory for Sakai, an affirmation of how they've been preparing and now they move forward. Yeah, think of it like a mid-semester report card. You're taking stock of where you're at, how you're performing, and you've gone up against the defending national champion and taken them down. I think you're sitting on close to a 4.0 heading into midterms. Well, there's a long way to go. The pro championships will be covered in their entirety. The finals on ESPN3 on Labor Day Monday, September 2nd. And then nationals also on ESPN3 this October in San Diego. Coming up about half an hour from now, the mixed championship game will air on ESPN3. Seattle mixtape trying to make it two titles for the 206 here in Minnesota. They'll take on the hometown team, Minneapolis Dragon Thrust. Final score of the men's final, Sockeye 15, Pony 12. For Ian Toner and Megan Tormey, I'm Evan Leffler saying so long from the U.S. Open here in Minnesota.